In 1986, ESNet was created to provide high-performance network connectivity for Department of Energy Office of Science researchers. The laboratories, uh, uh, particularly in the early days, uh, built the big instruments, instruments that were too big to put on campuses, like the cyclotron or the bevatron here at Lawrence Berkeley. The data generated from these experiments needed to be shared analyzed and archived by scientists back at their home institutions or in collaboration with partners around the world. We all couldn't afford airplanes. We all couldn't afford dedicated lines. We all had to figure out how are we gonna connect ourselves in a way that gets it done. What does get it done mean? Enough bandwidth to send the data, large pipes of data. Individual programs began to create their own networks that used their own protocols, including MFENet, HEPnet, and DECnet. So you had these three competing technologies, you had these three competing audiences, all doing their own science, all for the Office of Science. They were really worried that they would actually lose functionality by going to one single protocol. El Trivial Piece. Uh, at that time, uh, a senior official in the Office of Science dictated that we would all join one network. We had enormous cultural battles over, over this going forward. But a steering committee was formed of all of these forces, all of these prima donnas that liked their own technology, dedicated to their own science, and we were put in a room. And so, 25 years ago, ESNet was born enabling scientists from across the country and eventually around the world to connect and collaborate to advance scientific discovery. We said, if you want that data to go to an Office of Science laboratory, we are gonna put you in the fast lane. Everyone else was in the crunched up, slowed down network of the internet. Science was in the fast lane. Since that time, ESNet has grown. It now connects over 40 DOE Office of Science sites as well as research networks around the world. This allows scientists to collaborate on a global scale. Because of ESNet and its peers, the development of major science research facilities like the Large Hadron Collider was made possible. That was arguably the first major scientific experiment that depended completely on networks. That is, without an international network infrastructure, you couldn't do the LHC physics experiments. The network supports scientists doing research in a variety of disciplines, including fusion energy, climate, combustion, genomics, and astrophysics. The utilization of ESNet to help facilitate uh, the communications between ongoing experiments and uh, the control room activities, the, the, the transmission of that data uh, to the uh, frontline application scientists and the associated interactions are really crucial. Otherwise, we'd be having to fly our collaborators here to the combustion research facility and sit side by side in order to analyze or visualize or you know, understand the data. Linking researchers around the world means making connections across many different networks, each with their own policies, network attributes, and architectures. ESNet is not just providing the underlying network infrastructure, but also developing solutions to ensure the highest level of performance across this unique environment. Looking not just at uh, what is involved in moving data from the boundary of one lab to the boundary of another, but looking very hard at what got in the way of, and often did get in the way in the past, of delivering data to the researcher's desktop. ESNet and partners around the world have developed innovative solutions to address these challenges. A new dynamic virtual circuit technology called OSCARS gives scientists direct and dedicated connections to collaborators and resources worldwide. Other tools like Perf Sonar provide a global infrastructure for measuring and monitoring network performance in real time, enabling instant debugging of network issues from end to end. In order to solve this end-to-end -end problem of being able to move data reliably from a scientific instrument to the researcher thousands of miles away, is we have to look at all the different components that are needed to, to make that happen. The facilities you're seeing here generate data once. You better capture it, you better ship it to where it needs to be shipped, and you better not lose it. In 2011, ESNet carried on average about seven petabytes of data per month, and this is expected to grow by a factor of 10 in the next four years. 
By 2015, it's expected that ESnet will carry over 100 petabytes of data per month. To accommodate and anticipate this year-over-year -year data growth, ESnet is developing the world's first 100 gigabit per second nationwide network dedicated to science. The U.S. basically invented the Internet. It's critical that we stay in the lead. ESN's close proximity to Silicon Valley, the researchers at universities and, and the labs here, it gives us an opportunity to, to work with them in developing these new technologies that can keep U.S. at the forefront. ESnet is located on the campus of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory a hub of innovation for advanced networking since the very origins of the Internet. It is very important for ESnet to be embedded in an, in an organization like Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. ESnet is doing more than providing just the service. ESnet is an integral part of science. It's working with the scientists to understand what their requirements are and, in particular, to anticipate requirements in the future. What's mostly used by the everyday consumer uh, on the Internet, either sending email or ordering something online, this is all still based on technology back to the mid-80s. So it's very clear that there will be probably in the next decade some significant changes in how we're going to use networks, how we're going to provision networks, how networks will be integrated in our daily life. And I think ESnet is on the cusp of making some really important contributions with switched optical networks and how to integrate them into the scientific enterprise that probably in five years or thereabouts will have a tremendous impact. So from the last 25 years to now, then it was 110 bits per second with acoustic couplers. Today, we're a billion, not a thousand, not a million, but a billion times faster than that. All the things we wanted to have happen, the bandwidth, you know, the latency, uh, the ubiquitousness, and the reliability are all there now. And the science of the Department of Energy could not survive without it.